this shattering of their traditional roles by getting in shorts and going out and playing together for crowds and crowds of people. I, I think it's a really inspiring story. In the summer of 2014, Coventry City Ladies Football Club recreated an astonishing game from 1917. The players they represented on that day were the true pioneers of women's football. This is the story of women's football in Coventry during World War I. In 1914, the Great War began, dragging every corner of the world into its horror. The British Empire was a key force in World War I and it needed arms. It needed its factories to produce them. Cities like Coventry were key to the National Factory Scheme, where centres of engineering and manufacture became centres of arms production. With thousands of men leaving to fight, it was the women who were working in the factories, and they were called munitionettes. Well, women were already working in industry in large numbers before the First World War, but when the war broke out, it really increased the amount of opportunities that were open for women. And then as the war progressed, and particularly from 1915, women came into munitions work and manufacturing in large numbers. So for women who'd gone from domestic service into factory work, then that would have given them um, a far more um, a sense of community, a sense of um, friendship and cam camaraderie with the other women that they're working with. There was a huge influx in the population of Coventry with mostly women moving to the city to work here. A lot of the skilled work that the men had been used to doing had been broken down into much smaller, simpler tasks so that they could really quickly bring women into the factories, teach them one simple job, um, but then they'd literally be doing that job again and again and again all day long. It was very, very hard work, it was dirty work, and it was not what a lot of the women were used to doing they were all in it together. I mean, outside of the actual physical work in the factories, they were, a lot of the women were living together in, in accommodation that had been built especially for the workers with the, the huge influx of workers coming into the cities. Women often didn't leave their family homes until they were married. They were their father's daughter and then they were their husband's wife. And to actually leave the family home and go and live in a place with, with many other women uh, without their family or anyone really telling them what to do would have been very exciting, but I think very frightening as well. Although munitions workers were paid more than women would have been paid in other jobs, their pay wasn't, wasn't really that high. Um, I think a lot of the girls probably didn't really understand the dangers of the materials they were working with. We had in Coventry some of the key factories for output throughout the First World War. So it seemed like an obvious place for those, for those football teams to, to spring up. Um, and they started playing against one another. And then, of course, as, as they began to gain popularity. There were bigger games against factory teams from other cities as well. I think the football comes out of the fact that there is this concern about particularly young women working together in large numbers. Sports, particularly football, was one of the things that was developed as a way of keeping these girls, keeping them entertained, and filling their leisure hours. To keep the workers occupied at the weekends, the big factories organised games and sports events. In 1917, a foreman at Rudge Whitworth called Thomas Innsbury took this a step further. He formed the city's first munitionette team. Crowds flocked to watch their first game. It was such a success that soon other factories set up their own ladies' teams. Alongside Rudge Whitworth, there was the Humber Ladies, Coventry Ordnance Ladies, Coventry Chain, Daimler and White and Pops Ladies Football Clubs. Between 1917 and 18, the ladies' teams played many matches and tournaments across the city. And whilst we know of the teams, we know little about the players except for a few personal stories. Libra Lines is my great aunt. She was born in 1900, born and lived in Coventry all of her life. Libra is photographed in a studio, so she's gone to a lot of trouble, really. She's standing in a particular pose, looking directly at the camera. Um, almost a little bit defiant, um, but certainly wanting to be uh, stand there and be counted. In one of the factories that were making the munitions for the war, that's obviously a very dangerous occupation. And so I would think there's, there'd be quite a huge release, really, to have the opportunity to take part in sport. And she's obviously loving taking part in this. I love unearthing stories and finding things out. Um, and here we are with an image that's, um, that tells us lots, lots more about the lives of uh, 
a couple of generations ago, things that we just never ever knew. And it's amazing that from a photograph of my relative in a football kit, there's all of this massive national history. They weren't that gutsy at that early. I mean, they hadn't got the vote. Mum told me about her experiences playing football. She did say that ladies football took off because people were away at war. Uh, she said that she was very tall, taller than anybody else in the team, and um, she would trap the ball on her chest, uh, which was frowned on by the manager, male manager, and she got told off <laughs> quite frequently, but ignored it <laughs> and continued to do so. She was 14. I hadn't realised that she was playing football that early. The visibility of women doing new work, playing these football matches, starts to change people's idea about who women are and what they can be. It's women's ideas about themselves which really change as well. I think it would have been quite a liberating experience, particularly if you think just purely in terms of what they were wearing. I mean, women's clothes um, had started to be slightly less restricted, particularly in wartime, that accelerates. There was scaremongering really, I think, about their loose morals and particularly if they were women that were get, putting on shorts and you could see their knees and, uh, you know, them running around and doing all this physical exercise which was seen as so, so unbecoming for women at that time. In 1918, after four long years, the war finally ended. As women left their factory jobs, many teams disbanded but some continued to play. Nationally, women's football was growing in popularity, with some games attracting crowds of over 20,000 spectators. But many were still not happy with women's newfound freedoms. The Football Association led the way in discrediting the women's game, and in 1921, it dealt its devastating blow. The council feel impelled to express their strong opinion that the game of football is quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. The council requests the clubs belonging to the association refuse the use of their club grounds for such matches. Effectively, it was a ban. The FA was kicking women's football out. The FA ban in 1921 would have had an impact on women because it meant that they couldn't really play football to the extent that they had before because really it made it very difficult for them to play when they were not able to use league grounds. And I think if that ban hadn't have come into place, who knows where we would have been. Those attitudes wouldn't have had the chance to, to become what they are now. The fact that women were no longer able to play football is probably part of a wider uh, movement to sort of to have things slightly to go back to the status quo. Things didn't go back completely to how they were before the war, but there was a feeling that a lot of women should really revert to their pre-war roles. It's kind of like they went forwards this huge step and then they were forced to take a huge step back and we're still trying to, you know, get back to that point again. What women had achieved during the war years was astonishing, in the workplace and on the pitch. But the FA ban was to last for another 50 lost years. Well, I think they're amazing women because, firstly, they were doing jobs which were very, very dangerous. Um, but also, when they were getting involved in football teams, they were, they were putting themselves out in front of huge crowds. They were being daring in what they were wearing and what they were doing. They were really fracturing these expected roles that they should be fulfilling. It's easy to read about what women were doing um, to keep the country going, but to see the images and to get the whole sort of sense of the competitive sport is just fantastic. And in a sense, she's a pioneer, as they all were. They must have been gutsy ladies, because, you know, they wouldn't stand for much nonsense. Presumably, that was, you know, something that really gave a lot of freedom to women. For girls today who are growing up, if they hear these stories about these amazing women during the First World War, it might really inspire them to show them the potential of what they can be and what they can do. Thank you.